Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. We've been in a series, if you've been back or gone, uh, welcome back. Glad you're back here with us in the fall. We've been doing a series on the heart of God, and this is the final installation on the heart of God. But the heart of God really is one of love. The Bible says that God is love. Now, that's a little bit uh, ambiguous in our culture because we love everything. I mean, last night I have pepperoni pizza. I love pepperoni pizza. I love sports. I can't wait to go home and watch the football games. Uh, and next week, the football games and the baseball games. The Cleveland Indians are tough this year, by the way, in case you didn't know or you don't care. Cleveland's tough. Uh, I love my wife. I love my church family. And so you kind of go, well, which is it? Pizza or your wife? Well, it's both. But they're not equal. But in English, they're equal. In Greek, they're not. In fact, in Greek, there was nuance to that. So that the one Greek term for love was eros. It's where we get the idea of erotic love. And then there's phileo. It's a friend kind of love. And then there's agape love. That is selfless, serving, sacrificial kind of love. It is biblical love. And that's what God's all about. He is about agape kind of love. And it was revealed in the person and work of Jesus. When Jesus came here, he was born of the Spirit of God. In fact, when, when, when Gabriel came to Mary, he said, you're going, to have a, you're going to have a son. Well, how can this be since they don't know a man? Behold, you'll conceive, and what will come upon you will be the, the, the shadowing of the Holy Spirit. And what's going to be conceived in you is going to be the Son of God. So he's called the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was fully God and fully man. And he modeled and became an example for us of what, of what uh, the Lord was all about, what his heart was all about. And we're going to start a series next week on conversations with Jesus. You kind of see how he talks to people. Uh, but he loves, he loves people. That's, that's his nature. Now, it was not the nature of that day. In fact, the Romans thought if you were loving, you were weak, that there was, there was something wrong with you. And so when Jesus went around loving and caring for people, uh, at first they saw it as a weakness, but that really became the strength of his life, and it really became the thing that, that overturned the, the Romans, was this countercultural thinking that love is the best way, and that love never fails. But it's not only counter to the culture of that day, it's countercultural to, to our day. To be really loving in our day, you kind of say, hey, try going down the mall and just being friendly. Hey, how you doing? People give you the strangest looks, and I do that, I'm just, hey, how are you? My wife says, stop that, you know, it's like, <laughs> can't help myself, I love people. But it's counter to our culture, it's counter to our nature. And uh, naturally, we are selfish people. We, we want to get ahead for me. It's all about me. Reminds me of the story of the guy who bought a brand new refrigerator. And uh, so he, just, he had the old one left, decided that he would just give it away. So he put it on the curb and said, free, put a sign out there, said, free. No one took the refrigerator. It was out there and out there and out there. Finally, he put a sign on it that said, refrigerator, $50. It was stolen that night. That's the nature of people. I don't want them, it's free. But if I can steal it for free, I'll take it for free. And the, the, Jesus best exemplified this, this love with his disciples on the last night he was with his disciples. It was Passover. We call it the, the Last Supper, but it was Passover. And he said, I really wanted to be here with you guys. And when he got there, he recognized that nobody had, had uh, washed feet. And so that's the way he started. Without saying a word, just getting, wrapping a towel around him, getting a basin, and, and washing their feet. And he says, I leave you an example. If I have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. So he exemplified for us uh, the, the root of what love is all about, and that's thinking of others. We talked about that last week. Well, Peter caught that message, and so I want to spend the bulk of our time now in the book of 1 Peter, because 1 Peter gives us, gives us four principles uh, on love out of, out of the last book, uh, last chapter, 1 Peter chapter 5, and where he says, the elders who are among you I exhort whom a fellow, fellow elder, uh, and that you will also uh, be, be, uh, love, love them, not lording over them, 
those who God has entrusted you, but, but uh, be examples to the flock. Likewise, you younger people, verse 5, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. The first thing I want to say about love is that love is a choice. It's a decision that you make that you're going to love. Now, when Jesus was, was doing the foot washing service, by the way, anybody been in a foot washing service? Yeah, not a, not a really a big deal. I mean, and by the way, we're not going to be doing one soon. I've been to exactly one in my life, and had I known, I wouldn't have been to that one. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a big foot washing guy, and so when they, when I was at the Bible study, they said, okay, we're going to wash feet tonight, and it's based on the Bible, so what are you going to say? But then they said, okay, take off your shoes and socks, and I got to tell you, I'm worried about, you know, sock lint stinking to my, sticking to my toenails, I'm worried about toe, can I just tell you, I'm just thinking, what the heck, I don't know what's going on. And your toes are not the most attractive part of your personhood. You know, just really, just not. And so Jesus said, okay, I'm going to wash your feet. And, and, uh, and Peter said, you're not washing my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, and you can have no part in me. He said, okay, then give me a whole sponge bath. He said, no, we're not going to do that today. Just going for the feet today. But the example is something that he caught, because what he said was, Jesus said, I'm doing this for an example. And now he said to them, you who are elders in the body of Christ, you be examples. How do you do that? He says in verse 5, to clothe yourself with humility. Now, one of the decisions that you made today and you make every day is you choose, we choose a lot of things. We choose our attitude. We choose what's going to happen. But we choose what we're going to wear. When he says clothe yourself with humility, he's saying that the best dressed Christians are clothed in humility. You say, well, what is humility? Humility is not denying that you have strengths. Humility is acknowledging that you have weaknesses, but you also have strengths. One of the great questions you ask when you're interviewing people is, you know, what are your strengths of your life? You say, oh man, I got a million of them. I'm a leader and I, I got talents like this. What are your weaknesses? Uh, don't really have any of those. Well, that's a weakness because everybody's got weaknesses. In fact, C.S. Lewis says, Humility is not thinking less of yourselves, but it's thinking of yourselves less. And that's what love is. Love is thinking less of yourselves, and, and it's thinking about, about other people. And so when you do that, you, you choose to love. And you make that decision every day. You choose to close your th yourself with humility. You choose uh, every day. I choose the Lord every day. There are options out there. I choose to follow the Lord. I choose to be with my wife today. You're still with me, right? So it's a choice that we make every day. And uh, you say, well, what is that all about? I, I'll tell you this. It's a choice that you make because if you've been married more than five, six, seven years, you've got a reason to get out. You could come to me and say, Pastor, she did this, blah, 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 and I want out. And let me tell you, you say, well, that sounds strange. It happens to me all the time. They'll come in and say, well, you know, I just don't love him anymore. I just don't love her anymore. Then they go on one step. I'm not sure I ever loved him. Now, I want to tell you something that's, that's wrong. Actually, there's, uh, psychologists tell us that there are two reasons for family difficulties and family fractures. One is pride, and we're going to get to that in the next one. Uh, but the second one is selfishness. People are selfish. That is, I choose me over you. And the reason why there's so much failure of marriages in, in our culture and in the world is because people think more of themselves than they do the other person, and they choose them. And part of that is because of we're, we're a sex-saturated culture. And you got uh, young people who get involved in sex early, you know, and they get blinded by the sex, and so they get married and say, what did I do? Listen, um, sex uh, inside the confines, of biblical confines of marriage relationship is fine. When you get outside, 
what it becomes is bondage. Uh, we call it the bond of matrimony. And it's the, only time, it's the only time in the Bible where it says, he who sins with someone else sins against his own body. And what that means is when, when two come together, the two become one. And when you are not married and you become one, you're still in a bond, a spiritual bond. But if you're not careful, that bond becomes a bondage. And, and if you can imagine a rubber band here, the further apart you are and the longer you're apart, the more you feel the stress and tension of that relationship. Now, if you're, if you're married and you've been with somebody else before and you think of somebody else all the time, I tell you, those things need to be prayed for and those spiritual cords need to be severed because God wants you free. So you say, I'm not even sure what you're talking about. What I'm talking about is what love really is. Love is not sex. Love is expressed in intimacy, but love is not sex. And our culture has confused sex with love. And so we don't really know what love is. What is love? Love is a commitment. It's a decision that I make to be committed to you. You could go someplace else. You could do something else. But you make a decision. I'm staying here. And, and I love my church family. Could I have gone someplace else? Yes. Why didn't I go? I don't know. I've asked myself that over and over again, <laughs> especially in July and August. But the reason why is because of love and a decision to stay committed to what you believe the Lord has for you. And so biblical love, first of all, is a choice that you make. Secondly, biblical love uh, resists pride. Remember the two things that, that uh, obstruct relationships? Selfishness and pride. Well, the next verse says this. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He quote, he's quoting uh, Proverbs chapter 3 here. But what he's saying is when you have pride, when you have selfishness and pride in relationships, you've got problems. Well, what problems come from pride? Well, to begin with, contentious. Have you ever known anybody who's so proud they think they're always right? Don't raise your hand. We all know people like that. They love to argue. And their arguments are always right. Or like the couple I met and, and the, the gal said, I can't take this anymore. And I said, but you said he was Mr. Right. Yeah, but I didn't know his first name was always. It's, a, you know, always right. You got to always be right. And so that creates tension and it can take, creates contention in the relationship because they're too proud to back down and say, this is, this is not about me, which brings me to my email for the day. Three men were hiking through a forest when they came upon a raging, violent river. Needing to get to the other side, the first man prayed, Oh Lord, please give me the strength to cross this river. But instantly, the Lord gave him big arms and strong legs. He jumped in the river. He was able to swim across. It took him about two hours and he almost drowned. But, at, but he got the other side. After witnessing that, the first man prayed a little differently. He said, Oh Lord. Give me the strength and the tools to cross that river. Instantly, God gave him a rowboat, strong arms and strong legs. He was able to row across in about an hour. He almost capsized once, but he got across. Well, seeing that happen to the first two, the third man prayed even more intelligently. Oh, Lord, please give me the strength, the tools and the intelligence to cross the river. Boom. Instantly, he turned into a woman. She checked the map, hiked 100 yards, and walked across the bridge. I just read what you send me. It's, uh... But if you've got pride in a relationship, you've got, you got uh, contention, and you've got unforgiveness. An unforgiving spirit, uh, Mark Twain says, the tempers get you into trouble, but pride keeps you there. And... Basically, when you've, got, when you've got people, where there's motion, there's friction. And when you've got a lot of people, you know, you're going to have problems. Or the Bible says, uh, he who has a clean stall has no oxen. You know, uh, that's another way of putting it. It's, it's going to hit the fan when you're around enough people. And so how you deal with that is critical. And so pride says, I'm never wrong. I'm never going to admit that I'm wrong. And I'm never going to ask or give forgiveness. 
A forgiving spirit is somebody who is humble and resistant to pride and, and has learned, and believe me, this is a learned thing, learning to forgive is something that's caught at home or taught at home. Now, if you came from a home where they slammed the doors or walked out the doors or, you know, mom or, mom or dad left, then you didn't have a very good example of, of what it was all about. But I want to tell you something. The Lord wants to teach you. And part of agape love is learning to say these six words. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Not only are you clothed in humility, but you're resisting pride because there is nobody here who's not messed up. Nobody. It's just a degree that we've messed up. And so we all need forgiveness and we all need to be forgivers. And to the degree we do that, to that degree we're going to have uh, joy in relationship. And the final thing is judge, judgment. Ju we, we are, pride brings about three things. Contention, unforgiveness, and judgmentalism. The most critical and judgmental people I've ever met in my life are in the church. Hello. The most critical and judgmental people I've ever met in my life go to church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can you believe they were wearing that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Past and I've had people say this. Pastor, I can't believe I saw somebody in church. And the way our church lays out, we got somebody here and somebody here, and you kind of see because we're a fan. I can't believe they were in church. I can't believe you're saying that. He was without sin. Let him cast the first stone. Are you kidding me? You're telling me you can't believe they're in church? I can't believe you're saying that to me. They don't do that twice. Because all of us, and, and Jesus uh, said this, judge not that you don't be judged. He ended the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6. Judge not, you be not judged. For the same measure that you judge, it'll be measured back to you. If you are an unmerciful person, believe me, you're not going to get mercy. But if you're merciful and you're understanding, and I can tell you, the older I get, the more understanding I become and the more giving, I hope, I become uh, and gracious that you become. But judgment is, is not something that God has for us. And people who love do not judge. They're not argumentative, and they are forgiving. And all of those are a choice. Which brings me to the next verse. Verse, verse 6 says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in, in due time. Biblical love keeps perspective. Humble yourself. Uh, we tend to think that that's some, circumstances humbled me, or, or they were really humbled, or God humbled them. Listen, the Bible's admonition is that we humble ourselves. That is that we don't see ourselves better than other people. That was part of, part of Peter's problem. That's why Peter says, just like Jesus said, you need to be an example. You guys be examples. You need to clothe yourself in humility because Peter was a proud guy and Peter thought he was better than everybody else. Now you say, how do you say that? Well, think about it. Two things. Number one, when the Lord comes to wash feet, you're not washing my feet. And the second one was when the Lord said, you know, tonight I'm going to be left alone. All you guys are going to go sideways. He said, not me. He said, they might. He was, he's a they I guy. They might do that because they're just spineless jellyfish. He didn't, that's not biblical, but that's, they may do that, but I would never do that. Then Jesus said, listen, it's not a they I relationship. It's a we relationship. By tomorrow morning, you're going to deny you even knew me three times. We're all in the same boat. There's nobody here who has not failed. There's nobody here who does not fail. And love understands and is gracious and helpful and allows us to get, to get through this. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 that uh, uh, whoever uh, does not love does not know God. Because God is love. That's verse 8. God is love. That's where it's very, very clear. God is love. And if you're not a loving person, exemplified by all, by all these earmarks we're talking about, then you don't really know God. You may come to church, but you don't really know God. And you've got to keep perspective on yourself and on other people because the Lord wants to work in your life and, and, and through your life and in a sacrificial, selfless, giving kind of way. Which brings me to the final point, and that is 
Love surrenders its problems. Now, verse 7 says this, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. You got problems? Give it to the Lord. When you don't give it to the Lord, let me, let me, let me just say, when you don't give it to the Lord, when you're not forgiving, when you're not gracious, notice what takes place in verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, goes about seeking who may devour. Who's he devouring? Loveless people. People who don't love or people who think, I can do this. I don't need no stinking help. Yes, you do. I don't need forgiveness. Yes, you do. I don't need to care for other people. Yes, you do. When I was growing up, uh, one of the things that my brother loved was Superman. Does anybody remember Superman on TV? You're old. <laughs> do you remember Superman on TV? Not the reruns? You're old. You're old. Because super, you know, the reruns, I've seen reruns of Superman. I like Superman. My older brother watched Superman because he was old enough to watch Superman. I, I was old enough to even, not even to drink a bottle of milk then. But uh, they used to have Superman uh, kits because they, they always tried to engage the audience, you know, and they'd have different things. You'd have to get the different stuff. So the Superman kit consisted of four things. Because if you watch Superman, it's because you want to be Superman. And so Superman kit came complete with a jump rope, just to get you in shape, with hand grips so you could grip and your hand become, you become stronger, and with this, this handled gadget, two-handled gadget with springs that rips your chest hair apart. You know, you go like this, and if you put it by your chest, it hurt like a son of a gun. And the fourth thing was a life-size picture of Superman. So you got... Those four jump rope grips, pull your hair out, and Superman. The problem is the people that ordered Superman kits were eight years old. And they're looking at that because they say, I want to look like that. And they work and work and work for days and for weeks. Guess what? They don't look like Superman. No eight-year-old is going to look like Superman. Get this. We're supposed to look like Jesus. You don't. Not yet. You say, what do I do? Cast your care upon him. He cares about you. You know, the Lord loves you, knows about you, and cares about your problems. Did you know that? Now, one of the lies that comes in, and this is a lie, the adversary comes in like a roaring lion. He doesn't always come in in, in, in a very wow kind of way. Sometimes it's subtle. You know, if God really loved you, uh, that wouldn't have happened to you. If God really loved you, you wouldn't be in this situation. Those are lies. That is not true. But if you give place to that and you don't realize that you can cast your care upon him because he really does care about you. And so you begin to focus more on the Lord than on your problem. If you focus on your problem, your problem becomes massive. This thing that's little becomes giant. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's just so big. I just don't know if I can deal with this. And many people uh, make a mountain out of a molehill. And that's personally too. Because the Lord loves you and he cares about you. Say that out loud. The Lord loves me. The Lord loves me. And he cares about me. Cares about now Peter says that and I want to kind of wrap this up because we're talking about Peter. Peter says that because if there's anybody who felt low, it was Peter. Remember when he said, by tomorrow morning you're going to deny me three times? Guess what Peter did? Denied him three times. Then how do you feel? Well, I can't go around them. They're judgmental. And I want to tell you something. There are people that don't come to church because they messed up and the place that they should come for assurance, affirmation, and encouragement, they're afraid that if they come, they're going to get stabbed. That's not the Lord. The Lord sought Peter out. You remember? It's the last book of John. Sought Peter out and said, Peter, do you love me? Now the word that he used is agape. Do you biblically love me? Peter said, Lord, 
You know you're my friend, phileo. I phileo you. He said, feed my sheep. And he asked him again, Lord, he said, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. Feed my sheep. Then the third time he said, and this is where Jesus comes down to our level, Peter, do you phileo me? Oh, Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo you. Feed my sheep. You say, what that's all, what's that all about? It's about the Lord pursuing people who've messed up. He pursued Peter. He pursues you and me. And he wants us to become what we're supposed to become and move into what we're supposed to move into because he loves us so very, very much. Which is why Peter ends his second book by saying this, grow in grace. Grow in grace. God wants you to be more gracious tomorrow than you are today. Have a bigger heart tomorrow than you have today. And one of the things that happens to people, and uh, people that, that uh, are maybe hearing right now, and you're saying, oh, you know, I don't know. What, what has happened is you've been hurt. And hurt people get defensive, they build walls, and they get hardening of the spiritual arteries. And the Lord wants to, by the Holy Spirit, ream those bad boys out, and he wants, he wants you to have a flow, a fresh flow of, of, the, of his spirit because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. If you're here today and you're feeling condemned, I want you to know the Lord does not condemn you. He loves you. He cares about you, and he's saying, come on back. It's okay. If you know people that don't go back to church because they've been hurt by church, I want to, I want to encourage you to invite them. Say, you know what? The Lord's heart for you is one of love, and I know people that love, and they're just like me. And now don't fail me, church. When they come in here, I want you to be what? Loving. Loving. Reach out to people. I'm not talking to them. What if they reject me? Get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about them. Church is not about you. It's about them. And learning to love. And we're all in that process of learning to love, and we're all growing in grace, but the Lord wants to do some spiritual surgery on us, which we've been talking about all summer, and I want to conclude by praying for your heart. Let's stand together, can we please?